a warm welcome to ARPC and thank you for joining us online. My name is Daniel. I'm a part of the pastoral team here in ARPC. We are in the midst of our September topical series, Unchanging Marriages in a, cha in a Changing World. Pastor Chris said in last week's sermon that a marriage is like a couple riding a tandem bike you know, on the road together. It is not easy. And um, last week we have covered on marriage and this week we'll be talking about our family. Being a cyclist myself, I know that cycling alone is a battle with the elements and the terrain. And therefore, when cycling as a family, we must consciously look out for the safety and warn each other of the danger. As we begin, let me read to us from Proverbs 4, 1 to 2, which is written in the tone of a loving father instructing his children, after which I will pray. Proverbs 4, verse 1 to 2. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive, that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Let's pray. Father, we stand in awe when we witness your marvellous works in our lives. We stand in awe of the beauty of your heart. Everything in this world shall fade away and pass, but your love will remain. We praise you for your love and grace upon our lives. We trust in the plans that you have for us, for you are faithful to work out things for our good. We pray that each time people look at us, they will know that we are the children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Val and the music team will lead us in songs of praise. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. We come to a time of worshipping God through song. The worship of God is not just what our lips proclaim or the songs that we sing. We worship the Lord when our hearts ascribe greatness to who He is and what He has done. And to that, we need to pause, to ponder, to reflect. We need to look to His Word to enable us to see the beauty of His holiness and experience the gentleness of our Saviour. A Saviour whose great love for us led Him to be born as a man and to die on the cross. A Saviour who promises all who labour and are heavy laden to come to Him and He will give you rest. Would you rise with me for those of us here?
The next song that we're going to sing is a fairly new one that I've been listening to in recent weeks and has, has been such a helpful reminder for me to cling on to the one certainty and hope that we have in these unpredictable and uncertain times. Our Lord Jesus Christ, may the song bring encouragement to you that your hearts be stirred and your souls move to sing here in your heart and proclaim that Christ is indeed our hope in life and death. and the music team. Now let's read the Bible together, our responsive reading. Oh, please sit. Have a seat. <laughs> our responsive reading is taken from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. Please turn with me in your Bibles or look at the screen in front of you. I shall start by reading um, the first slide and please respond in silent reading. Proverbs 2, verse 1 to 22. My son... If you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, 
making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you, if you seek it like, like silver and, and search for it as for hidden treasures, treasures then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, comes uh, come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. Together, for, for the, the upright, upright will inhabit the land, and, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the, the wicked, wicked will be cut off from, from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of, out of it. Thank you. We'll take this time to welcome anyone who is new with us uh, on site. If you are visiting us for the first time, can I ask of you to raise your hand and so that we can acknowledge you? Welcome. We have a church handbook that you can actually pick up on your way out. And uh, inside this handbook, you can read about the work God is doing in and through ARPC. Um, please take some time to fill up the tear-off portion uh, that you have here. And uh, for those who are online, um, if you click on the handbook icon for e-copy and that will lead you to a connect card, um, please fill up the connect card so that we can know you and serve you. May I turn your attention now to the announcements? The announcements is for our prayer and our participation. How are you feeling as this pandemic rolls on? In all honesty, growing irritation, growing frustration, growing uncertainty, but more frightening, the growing anxiety, anxiety of the present, anxiety of the future, anxiety in the morning, anxiety at night, anxiety about our children, anxiety about our jobs. God didn't create us to be overwhelmed with anxiety and paralyzed with worry. Come listen to His Word as we begin a new series, Exodus chapter 19 to the end of the book, that speaks of God's compassionate love that speaks of God's great power to offer us the greatest escape from a fallen world. Please come in person, virtually, invite your family, invite your friends to hear the glorious gospel and to come out, not simply of a pandemic, come out of a world in which we cannot save ourselves. Come join us for Church Prayer Fellowship tonight as we turn the spotlight on the land of kimchi and K-drama. If you have a heart for special needs, this is also a good opportunity to find out more about this ministry and to be praying specifically for it. In order not to do a crash landing, please register at arpc.sg slash register CPF, then log on at 7.30pm and be richly blessed. At some stage in life, we're bound to have big questions about life and death, which perhaps confuse us, baffle or frustrate us, and we don't quite know where to turn. 
Discovering Christianity is a course that tackles those very questions as we explore what the Bible says about the core beliefs of Christianity. This is a four-week course over Zoom, and we do ask you to commit four Sundays, starting this Sunday, 26 September, at 2 p.m. You do have a choice of a group setting or a one-on-one -on -one session. Registration is online at arpc.sg discover, and you can always send inquiries to dc at arpc.sg. As we pray for the Special Needs Support Network this weekend, we are thankful that they are serving us by conducting a workshop on discipleship for children with special needs. What is the connection between the formation of faith and character? What is the biblical perspective of Christian education? Mrs. Janice Ho of the Koinonia Inclusion Network is a paediatric occupational therapist who has worked in the disability sector. She will certainly be a wonderful resource for children's church teachers and parents of children with special needs. The workshop is on this Sunday, 3 to 5 p.m. on Zoom, and registration is with Huyen at sn2 at arpc.sg. The next announcement is MPR, our Marriage Preparation Retreat. This is a retreat for all couples seriously dating, praying, seeking for a lifelong marriage of love, living under God, living differently to the world. Please sign up for this. It's October 23rd and 24th. Registrations are needed. The venue is and the mode of delivery is yet to be determined depending on COVID-19 situation. We'll keep you in touch. Thank you. We thank God for all the spiritual nourishment this weekend as you prayerfully consider your participation. We come, we come to a time of financial giving, a time to honour the Lord for His generosity to us. As members and regulars of ARPC, let's prayerfully consider our commitment to financially support our church and all its ministries that God has called us to. If you're new or visiting with us, we hope you feel welcome and encouraged by God's Word. And please do not feel obliged to give. Aside from the general offering, let's remember God's gift to us in the form of ARPC at Tengah, where we are currently growing our financial resources for the building of these new premises. Do take note, it's a separate QR code from the general offering. May we be the cheerful giver that God has called us to be, trusting that God supplies our every need according to His glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now let us all stand as I lead you in a congregational prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, even the psalmist who is facing an exile cannot remain quiet but break into praises of your wondrous love. Psalms 57, 9-11 sings, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For your great love reaching the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. You alone are worthy of our praise. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, we are, uh, you are above it all. And no situation is too difficult for you that you can't solve. In your greatness, yet you bend down to hear our prayers like a father tenders, tender love for a little child. Father, we, we strive to be a household of faith under the Lordship of Christ. Help us to speak words of kindness, words of love, of forgiveness and correction. Hold our tongue when we are tempted to speak in a sarcastic, hurting or malicious manner. Give us the wisdom to build each other up by, by saying only what is helpful according to, to our needs. Especially in the next two weeks where the children will be doing home-based learning and parents who work from home, we ask for peace in the family where we bear with uh, one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave us. May we put on love which binds everyone together in perfect unity. 
allow us to have meaningful conversations on the dining table as we turn our complaints to thanksgivings. May we draw the family closer together with a good routine of prayer, reading of God's Word, and sharing of our struggles. We, thank, we are thankful for couples who have started their marriage preparation on the right footing, striving to apply biblical principles to every decision that they make. As the couples discover more about themselves and about their partners, Lord, please reveal to them the blind spots that they fail to notice so that their preparation for marriage is not just for the wedding, but to work out the areas of disagreement in a constructive manner. Not to tear each other down with sarcastic remarks, but to build each other up in truth and love. We are thankful for the church leaders who share their struggles with the couples um, of their marriage and how the grace of God, by the grace of God, they manage to work it out. For couples to have a good role model of Christ-centered relationship. One that is not perfect, but is filled with the humility of Christ, the willingness to serve one another, and the love that is unconditional, in an unconditional manner. Father, may you allow good conversations, laughter to take place during MPR, and that the couples will have a good, uh, have a better idea of what a marriage under the Lordship of Christ looks like. We are thankful for this gift of ARPC Tengah, the opening to many possible opportunities to minister to the existing Bukit Batok West community as well as the new Tengah estate. We ask that the Holy Spirit go before us to soften the ground that the people might be ready to receive the gospel. May you allow the approvals of required submissions so that the, the building project can proceed smoothly. We pray for the various committees involved in the building and the fundraising project to serve with great joy, humility, and unity. May the church members also contribute generously to support the building of his kingdom. Finally, we, we cover Pastor Chris, his wife Mona, and the rest of his family in prayer as they serve the church in various ministries. Strength, shield them from the flaming arrows of the evil one so that they will stand firm in the Lord. Bless them with the joy and the peace that comes from the hope in Christ Jesus. In, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Amen. Please be seated. The Bible passage today is taken from Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 4. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for, that, for this is right. Honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them out in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now let's hear from Pastor Chris. Thank you all for joining us in our service. As um, those who are tuning in, perhaps from overseas, where we are here in Singapore locally, there's been a spike and in the numbers, and so um, continue to pray for us as we pray for the rest of the world that will depend on God's mercy and God's grace for everything and the living out and the facing and the overcoming of this pandemic. Unchanging families in a changing world. I caught this documentary uh, during the recent Olympics, about China's table tennis players. And it zoomed in on one who was really gifted, talented, the new blood, right? a prodigy as it were, and quite a maverick. And so they asked him in this documentary about his training, about his ups and downs. And finally, they asked him about his relationship with his coach. And he said something along this line, um, my coach is like an irritating bumblebee. My coach is a little bit like a, a pesky fly, uh, always giving me advice about my shots, about my smashes, about my defense, about my strategy, always giving me advice about everything. But I don't listen 
He is just background noise. I don't know what he... I, don't, I know that he cares and what he says is good. That's why he continued saying. But I don't listen. I don't listen. I don't listen until I lose badly or until I behave badly and the two things are related. That's when I realise that my coach makes sense. And then he laughs, he shrugs his shoulders, he shakes his, bends his head. I was thinking, how true, right? That this is perhaps why we are in so much trouble, no matter what status or status or season of life we are in, whether we are single or married or whether we've got families, we treat God as an uninvited guest. We treat God as an unwelcome intrusion. God is like an irritating bumblebee. He's like a pesky fly, always giving us advice about, about everything. But we don't listen. God is just background music. His background music. I know that He cares. I know He's good for me. But I don't listen until I not just merely lose a game, but I lose in the game of life. When I lose my temper so badly, I never realized I could be so mad in married life, in family life. When I lose my respect for my parents, I never realized how unfilial and dishonoring and disrespectful I could be in thought and word and deed against my parents who's always loved me, always had a long fuse, played the long game with me. But in a moment of self, I can be so disrespectful. I never realized I could lose my love and could be so treacherous to my God-given spouse who has been faithful unto me. I don't listen until I realize I'm capable of behaving, behaving really badly. And messing up really badly. Is God a bumblebee? Is he a pesky pest? Is he background noise to you and I? That's why your life, whether single or married or family, is in a mess? Which leads us to a gospel truth. And what is that gospel truth? Let's see whether this comes on. A gospel starting point, a God starting point, is acknowledgement, is confession, that I'm a good listener to what? <laughs> Left to myself, in my sinful nature, I'm a good listener to my fickle ones. And they keep changing. In one period of time, I really wanted this. In another period of time, I really wanted that. That's why we fall in love, we fall out of love. And if I'm a good listener to my selfish needs and my fickle ones, that makes me a very bad listener to God. To God's faithful word, speaking to us, His living and enduring word. We just learned that in 1 Peter. His living and enduring word that gets us to be born again and gets us to be holy, both saves us and sanctifies us. That's why, because we are such bad listeners, such bad listeners to God and His Word and His will, that's why we must always have a series about listening to God, about our singleness, about our married life, about our family life, about our church life. With singleness, we learn from Sam Aubrey that it shows us the sufficiency of the gospel. With marriage, we learn it shows us the shape of the gospel. Then when we look at the Christian men and women standing here making their vows and walking around and living out their Christian life, we are looking at a small picture, a snippet of the perfect bridegroom and his bride. It looks at the spiritual union of one fleshness. Today, we will look, as Daniel has prayed, at families. We will trace it from creation to the fall, and then how God raised Israel to be a light despite the fall, and how God finally redeems us. And that's how we should always think of the Bible. And from the Bible, which is God's Word, think about ourselves. We have a starting point. You are not autonomous. I'm not autonomous. The starting point is that you are created by God. 
The starting point is because God created you, you are accountable to Him in the end. There's a start point to your life, there's an end point to your life. Don't you ever bind to the devil's lie that you are born independent, born to be freed from God. That's a lie. And so whenever we take you through, and you're tuning into this, we walk you through what we call biblical theology. Technically, it's God's love story for you and me. There is a starting point, there is an ending point, and in between, that's what he calls us to. So last week, we saw that marriage is what? At, at the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, that marriage is God's good idea. And so you cannot change the institution of marriage. You cannot change the institution of marriage, which is one man, one woman on earth. It's enough to meet every need, spiritual, mental, emotional, in the imaging of God. Today, we will see that the family, our human families, our biological families, our flesh and blood families, is also God's good idea. How do you know that? Genesis 1 tells you that. Let's see. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, what is it that God said to them? The first word of God to the first couple. The first word of God to the first couple, listen carefully. Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and then rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the, in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so, if marriage is a good idea, children are a good idea. And God put a man and woman together so that you get children, progeny, to fill the earth. And as you fill the earth from the first couple, you get the first family, you rule the world on God's behalf. And all that is part of the imaging of God. From the fruit of their love, and the goodness of their one fleshness would come children to fill the earth and rule the world on God's behalf. And so in creation, both marriage and family is God's brick and mortar, is God's Lego piece, is God's building block for the stability of society. We tinker with marriage and say, who says it has to be marriage? Why can't we just live with each other? de facto relationships, which has now taken on legal status or status in the West. You don't need this thing called marriage. It's old-fashioned and it's enslaving. It's curtailing. It's Judeo, it's Christian. It is not good. It's not good for postmodern people. You cannot improve on the institution of marriage. You can only improve on marriages within the institution. It's the same you cannot tinker with the institution of family. You can only improve as the Cha family, the Lim family, the Smith family. And that's very important. We tinker with marriage and family at our own detriment. And so, whatever we do not know as you read this, it speaks, Genesis 1 and 2 introduces us to a good God with a good heart, with a good will, with a good purpose to make men and women in His image and get, invite men and women to share in what he shares, right? To share in what he shares, love in marriage and family. And so when God says, let there be, and it was, and if you read the rest of the Bible, God is, God is glorious. God is beautiful. God is wondrous. And this God who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, what is it he makes us to share? Beautiful shared moments, with God and with one another. And so, an English word for this is benevolent. A good God, good in every way, good in His intentions and good in His actions. You know, many of us, we've got good intentions, but what do you suffer from? Bad implementation. You always wanted to lose weight, you never lost weight. <laughs> it's a good intention, it's bad implementation. How many people got married with the intention to get divorced? You must be loony. You must be out of your mind. Nobody does this. How many people raise children only to make them delinquent? Only to make them rebel against you? 
is good intentions but bad impl implementation. And so benevolence at the start, a good God with a good heart, with a good purpose, with a good word, let there be, and it was. And so there are glimpses of this. We bear God's image, and there are glimpses of this even in our fallen world. And so after many years of cleared up a portion of my house, Marie Kondo spirit, clean, uh, spring cleaning spirit, and found a whole stack of photographs. Right? A whole stack of photographs, and what did I find? This is one of them that I found. Okay. So a benevolent God created us for beautiful moments, glimpses of our, my beautiful family under God. That's my dad and mom, and that's me. My dad is carrying me. And my 11 siblings, I keep talking about my 11 siblings, my family of 12, just in case you think I imagine it. <laughs> and so I've put this photo right on my stairway and a few others that I'll show you in time when I write a book. Whenever I look at this photo, I remember my elder sister who is standing beside me and my dad on the left-hand side. My elder sister, who was smart enough to go to university, but didn't go to university, because dad's business went downhill, turned south, and she sacrificially went out to work. Same with my second sister, both brilliant, but gave it all up to look after us. And whatever she was earning as a teacher in our hometown, she saved, she gave, she gave and hardly saved. And with whatever she was earning at that time as a teacher, I was put as the youngest in the family into kindergarten. I was the only one of 12 children who had a kindergarten education. That's why I'm so high IQ. <laughs> Whenever I look at that photo, I remember my sister. And there's a fondness in my heart. I look at my second sister, I could tell you another story. I look at my third sister, I could tell you another story. I look at my brother, I could tell you another story. I got 11 stories to tell, and that's not including my dad and my mom. And when we look at love, it may be through rose-tinted lenses, it may be selective. I do not want to remember the bad things. I choose to remember the good things. I stand in front of that photograph, and I do look, and I remember. There are glimpses of God's goodness towards us. You should stare at a photo ever so often, a family photo, and remember how loving, how sacrificial your dad, your mum, your siblings were to you. That's benevolence flowing through our veins. That's benevolence flowing through our veins. That's important. But immediately as you read the Genesis account, what do we have? We have Genesis 3, the serpent coming to tempt Eve. And from that point onwards, marriages and families spin downhill. So we say that marriages and families are under attack in the 21st century. That is both right and mistaken, that statement. Marriages and families came under attack from the first family. And how did it come under attack in in the first couple's family, it came under attack when Cain and Abel came along. And when Cain and Abel came along, what happened? The serpent tempts Eve to doubt God's benevolence, God's good word, God's good design for marriage and family. And then that cascades into three broken relationships. When Satan enters your life, he breaks things. A broken relationship with God, a broken relationship between the husband and wife, he will rule over her and she will rebel against him. And there is no more control over the created world. When Satan enters your life, it is brokenness. You want to write it down somewhere? It's not by chance. It's deliberate. He came in to break things up for you. When Satan enters your life, it's dysfunction. And from that moment onwards, every family becomes dysfunctional. Genesis Four onwards records for us the sad story of malevolence. Malevolence is the opposite of benevolence. It is evil intent. Nothing of Satan is good. He's against God's good person. He's against God's good purposes. He's against God's good pur uh, people. 
That's so important for us to realize. And from malevolence come brokenness, from brokenness come dysfunction. And it is bottomless, it is limitless. The hurt and the harm when we are disconnected from God, the danger and the risk we carry and are capable of. And so from this point onwards in Genesis 4, is a tale of two brothers that Cain hates Abel. He starts by bringing an unacceptable gift to God. Instead of searching his heart, that he probably brought an unacceptable gift to God, he spends all his time searching his brother's heart. And finally, he would, not only, he would only be satisfied, not simply in judging his brother's heart, but taking his brother's life. The first incident of sibling rivalry begins in Genesis 4. It's a story of brokenness, a story of dysfunction. The rest of Genesis chapter 3 to 50 is a sad catalogue of what? A sad catalogue of the sin of the patriarchs, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, and it goes on all the way to, to Joseph. The litany of family breakdown litters the whole Genesis account. It is bottomless, it is limitless. Bottomless and limitless. Abraham's cowardice, which jeopardizes Sarah twice as he lies about her being his sister. And both times she's taken to a harem. And a harem she could really could have been abused. Rebecca's favoritism and deception of her husband, Genesis 27. Jacob's selfish deception of Esau, another sibling rivalry. And then Joseph's heart-wrenching betrayal by his brothers. What do you call those chapters? Chap Genesis 3 to 50. It's a litany and list of the spread of sin. And so Genesis records for us what? The serpent tempts us to ugly shed moments. If God created us for beautiful shed moments that so images Him, that so reflects Him, Satan has only one goal, to tempt us to ugly shed moments in marriage, in ugly shed moments in family, and ugly shed moments in life. Full stop, period. And so what does Genesis show us? The spread of sin from the first couple in Genesis 3 to the first family in Genesis 4, Cain kills Abel, to the first polygamy, to culminating in the flood where God looked down and saw that the heart of man, the intentions of man, was only evil all the time. That all the meditations of our heart was only evil all the time. Three superlatives of evil. And God had to wipe that generation out by a flood. And then we repeated that. The flood wasn't the cure to sin. We repeated the rebellion against God and now was the Tower of Babel. So this unstoppable spread of sin sees us cascading helplessly from one level of depravity to the other. And so the two words, the first attack on marriage, the first attack on family, it is bottomless and limitless. As you read the rest of the Bible, there is incest, there is rape within families. But then God calls Abraham. From Abraham comes Israel, and from Israel there is hope. But before we get to the hope, I was writing a paper for this, and I pray and hope that you will read this paper. It's in the book. And in the words of one Christian scholar, Kostenberger, he says, there are six breakdowns of family life when you read the rest of the Bible from Genesis 50 onwards. There is polygamy, there is divorce, there is adultery, there is homosexuality, and that begins very early in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is sterility, and then there's gender role confusion. Nothing's new under the sun, friends. It all comes when we have a broken relationship with God. But we find glimpses of hope when God calls His people, beginning with His call to Abraham, that God chose to bless him, and through Abraham's family, he'll be a blessing, a global blessing. And so Proverbs 2 is one of those wisdom books. Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Job, the wisdom books. 
And Proverbs 2, that we read for our responsive reading, set up a, sets out a roadmap for godly parenting in Israel's life, God's people. It's not prescriptive, but it's descriptive. It won't give you the A to Z for every problem. It will actually give you a framework. So what does Proverbs 2 tell us? Here it is. My son, if you accept my words and store my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom, applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, this is a father speaking to a son, and all first five chapters of Proverbs begin with, my son, my son, my son. If indeed you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for wisdom as you look for silver, and search for it as if you are looking for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So there are three principles to parenting in Israel's life before we actually look at the visions and the, three, and the principles that are there. And the first principle seems to be this, that godly parenting involves lifelong, tireless calling out to our children to seek wisdom, to fear the Lord and to love the Lord, to fear the Lord and to love the Lord. And we speak this into their hearts ceaselessly, tirelessly, from the time they, they come into the world, from the time they go to kindergarten and the time they go to primary school and secondary school, all the way to JC, all the way to ITE, all the way to poly, all the way to university. We speak this word to them always calling out to our children to fear God, to love God, to fear God, to love God. That's the first imperative of godly parenting. The second goes on, Psalm 2, uh, Proverbs 2, verse 9. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. So if the first role of godly parenting is to tirelessly speak God's calling for them to be wise, fear the Lord, love the Lord, fear the Lord, love the Lord, then the second anchor is as you call them, God is using you to form the character of the child then you will understand. Then wisdom will enter your heart. The character of the child is being formed as you speak God's word into their heart. Enters the heart, delights the soul, gives them discretion and understanding. You know what this is actually saying, the second part of Proverbs 2? If you pray and teach and model, and pray and teach and model, slowly they should internalize this. Slowly, the child that you raise under God should own this. They are God and they are faith in God for themselves. The internalizing of faith. It's not out there. It's in here. The forming of the character. So if the calling and the forming is taking place, it will lead us to a third thing as part of the framework of godly parenting. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse jumps a few verses. Wisdom will save you not just from wicked men, wisdom will save you from the adulterous women, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and not the covenant she made before God. You couldn't get more practical about life, right? And so if God's high calling to God's people, beginning with Israel in the Old Testament, is you will, as godly parenting, tirelessly, ceaselessly, Call your children to fear the Lord, love the Lord, and form the character of God in them. Then, the third anchor of parenting, they won't need you forever. They will then be able to make godly choices for themselves after their character is formed. And so God did not create our children. The highest goal of Christian parenting is not taking them from Total dependence upon you from the time they are born. As a baby depends on you 24-7 for milk, for nurture, for everything. Leading them to independence from you. Your highest calling as a Christian parent 
is to lead them from dependence upon you to total dependence upon God. It's to lead them, at least to empower you to make the next worshipper of God. And that's very, very important. And so godly parenting is calling, is forming, and then enabling our children to make godly choices for themselves. By the time the child goes to school, they have to choose their friends. By the time they go to school, they have to choose what to watch on the internet. By the time they go to NS, they want to listen to that wrong fellow or the right fellow. By the time they go to university, it's, it's all that. Have I told you the story of this? A couple used to worship here but had to go overseas for their work. And daughter went overseas to study in, from, from uh, Hong Kong, had to go to the UK to study, and then fell in love with this guy while studying overseas. Wonderful guy. Only one problem, not a Christian. Only one problem, not a Christian. Every other way, wonderful guy. As is the norm everywhere, if you really love me, you will sleep with me. She had a choice to make. She was thousands of miles away from her parents. Guess what she did? If it was you, what would you do? Do I tell my parents I have a non-Christian boyfriend? That's the first choice you want to make. No, actually, you have to go backwards. Why did I get attracted to him in the first place? Why did I start? Now that I've started and got entangled, do I tell my parents? She told her parents. She asked her parents for advice. The parents said, you have to decide. You know what we've taught you all this time. And she had to decide. Cut it off. You know, when you drop a relationship, ah, will I ever find a man like that again, so good looking and so good in so many things, so similar to me? Well, I find as the bio clock goes on, she, of course, she was young, no bio clock yet. Will she look back on that 10 years from now and say, ah, the calling, the forming, and the choosing. And she made the choice. And it was a good choice. And she could fly back all the way to Hong Kong and tell her youth fellowship that that's the choice she made. You can't prevent children from facing those temptations. You can pray for them, but you can nurture them and get them to choose. You choose God. Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan? It sounds like the director of uh, Batman movies. For those who are Batman fans, I'm not. I just happen to know. <laughs> born in the UK, born in 1965. He suffered from cerebral palsy after experiencing oxygen deprivation during birth. And so with cerebral palsy, no control over any part of his body. Nothing could move, just here, no control. But he learned to write painstakingly. How? By directing a pointer attached to his head at a keyboard with the help of his family. And he learned to write how long does it take you to write? <laughs> I've just sent off a whole, whole stack of birthday cards. I tried to write a personal note, right? After writing for about an hour, I said, oh, pain. <laughs> I've got another 50 more to go because there are 1,700 members here. To write a personal note and a personal card, is, it's old-fashioned, but young. 30 minutes per word. It took 10 years for him to write this book. And through this painstaking method, he produced three books, one of which won him the Whitbread Prize, which is a very prestigious literature prize. How on earth did he go from cerebral palsy to prestigious book prize winner? From the time he was born, his family treated him as normal. They read to him, they sang to him, they did things with him, they filled his mind without no, no response from him. No response. Then one day in that journey, his mother noticed that he really liked the reading. And she could see from his 
pupils, his eyeballs. They were so excited about this. Mothers know. A devoted parent knows. There is that EQ, there's that bonding, right? And so he learned to write. From that moment onwards, she taught him how to write, unlocked his voice through that writing. And so, after he won the Whitbread Prize, every newspaper featured him, interviewed him, and they asked Christopher Nolan, what would you do if you're given a second chance of being born again? Right? What would you do? What kind of things would you ask for? Surely a normal, healthy, complete body. And he said through his mother, of course he can't speak, he said through his mother, no, I will jump right back to the same body. To the same cerebral, palsy, handicapped body. And the interviewer asked why. And his answer to his mother, to the reporter was, this is the way God made me to glorify Him. This is the way God designed me to glorify Him. Godly parenting is a tireless, lifelong journey to call children to love God and to fear God, to form the character of God in them and to make them and to pray and hope they will make godly choices in their life. If you spoke to his parents, they wouldn't think they're perfect in any way, but just blundering along. But they could share God's love with him, no matter how limited. By the time we come to the new... So actually, there are glimpses of this. The glimpses of the beautiful shared moments in marriages and family life, especially in Israel's life. But there were also many glimpses of ugly moments in the life of the kings, in the life of the prophets, in the life of Israel. Lots of it, beginning with rape and incest, as we said, and the six things that were listed down there. And so you know that Proverbs, the wisdom literature itself, would not bring about this new heart. It would actually have to come in the perfection of wisdom. The one man who would fear God and love God perfectly, Jesus, the embodiment of wisdom. And when Jesus comes, we trust in Him, we look to Him for all things. And last week, as we look at the Christians, hus wives, submit to your husbands, right? And the model of it is the church submitting to Christ. And husbands, you love your wife as Christ loved the church. Everything is Christocentric. Everything is surrounding, revolving your life around Jesus is going to be the same with Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, obviously in the Lord Jesus. For this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, that it may enjoy long life on the earth. And so here is the Christ-centeredness that all of our lives, and it's a very huge thing here, whichever epistle you read, here is our basis. And then you'll go on to say, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So mutual instructions, children, you obey your parents. And fathers, you do not frustrate or exasperate your children. Each one has ministries and duties under the Lord Jesus. You know what this, what we call the household code actually says? You bring Jesus into every relationship. You bring Jesus into anything. You bring Jesus into marriage, it changes everything about marriage. Doesn't change the institution, changes me as a Christian husband to my wife Mona. Bring Jesus into Mona's life, changes her submission to me from unwilling drag your feet to, yes, Chris. How can I serve you today? Bringing Jesus into everything, bringing Jesus into a child's life takes them from point A to point B. Starting point of sin, ending point of holiness. Bringing Jesus into a father's life, into a parent's life changes everything. Bringing Jesus into a master's life changes everything. Bringing Jesus into a slave's life changes everything. I just want to pause here and ask you, 
Do you believe this? Do you believe this? If I don't believe this, I quit. As part of integrity, I quit. If I counsel you one-to-one -one and I don't believe this, I'm a liar. If I don't believe this, I shouldn't be here with you. By the grace of God, I believe this more and more. This is the beautiful shared life between Christ, the bridegroom, and his bride. And everything under that changes. You believe this, and your life will undergo radical change. So the difference Jesus makes to children, he will take children, a child, from rebellion to the honouring of parents. And the honouring of parents will come out in obedience. And so here in Ephesians 6, it's very important. When it says children, most likely they are minors. Because in verse 4, they're still being taught and they're growing up. Obedience in the Bible is rather absolute. In the Old Testament, to obey and to honour was the same, right? To obey and to honour was the same. Disobedience in the Old Testament, we're going to read it in Exodus 20, Dis dishonouring of parents is punishable by death. In the New Testament, we obey Christ and apostles' teaching. But to really understand honour and obedience, we really need to understand disobedience and dishonour. In Romans 1, 30, disobedience is an expression of our pagan past and our godless life. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, disobedience is part of the last days. So when we disobey, no matter how rational or reasonable, if you had my kind of parents, uh, you would also not respect them. Whenever we disobey, no matter how rational or reasonable, disobedience links us to our godless past and identifies us with our present godless age. In the last days, people will be disobedient to the parents. Disobed rebellion is part of our sinful character. We must firstly understand that. If Christ didn't come into your life as a child of God, you would be rebellious. Have you ever seen young children respond to their parents this way? Yippee! My mother said, finish the food, and I finished the food. Yippee! My dad said to me, time for gaming is up, and I gave it up. And you march off, your children march off like the seven dwarfs, are, hi ho, hi ho, let's, let us do what daddy says. No child walks away, hi ho, hi ho. The child actually thinks, who are you? Who are you? I'm just waiting to get my license to get out of this house. How long can two NS men, national service men, right, recruits, go without swearing against their commanding officer? Don't know, you time, you time. Okay? How long can two employees talk without complaining against their boss? You should time it the next time. How long can two Singaporeans get together without grumbling against the government? You roughly got the message that in your fallen nature, you are a rebel. Nobody ever had to teach you how to rebel. So to move you from rebellion to honour is Jesus' work. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Left to myself, I will never obey my parents. But left to Jesus working in me, it can happen. And so it says, right, if you, you obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, you honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, this was given to, to Israel. And in, for Israel is that you may go well in the land. But now in Ephesians chapter 6, verse, verse 1 to 3, it actually says, it may go well for you on the earth. That means wherever you are as a believer in Jesus, we pray that you have long life. It doesn't mean that if you're an obedient child, you will never die young. There are godly children who die young. But it says this is generally true. This is the long life and the good life if you honour your parents. It was true when God gave it to Israel. It's true as God gives it now to new Israel. And you and me are new Israel in Christ Jesus. And so 
how might this work in practical terms? For all of us as children, you've got to, like Proverbs 2, keep listening to God's Word, keep discerning any friends or anything on social media that is encouraging you to be disrespectful of your father or mother. And there are lots of things out there from TikTok, talk, talk, or whatever talk that's encouraging you to be disrespectful of your parents. You've got to have this fear of God to say, I'm not going to listen to that rubbish. It's really rubbish. Have you seen this video? Have you seen bang? Trigger happy, trigger happy, trigger happy. Keep forwarding messages. How many parents have told me? Here in Singapore, all over the world. My children, by the time they become teenagers, oh my goodness, what happened to them? I have no idea. And now it's getting younger and younger. From 11 or 12, they think they are 25. That I, I know what it means to be an adult. Please don't tell me what time to sleep. Please don't tell me what kind of friends to choose. Please don't tell me anything. I'm actually on top of the world. But my friends can tell me things. Never get used to di being disrespectful. I've told this many times. From John Piper's church, his pastor in charge of our families came here. We got him to give a conference. And with every speaker that comes, we host them in our home here. I got talking to him. And I think they had three children and three daughters. And he said, um, yeah, if anybody wants to come and date my daughters, uh, he, Michael, he sits down and talks to them and um, says to all the guys who are interested in his daughters, um, I'm Christian, and I hold on to these values. If you date my daughter, I expect you to treat her with dignity. And that might mean you opening the car door for her. That might mean bringing her back on time. That might mean asking for permission. And it's good that you're here asking for permission. I raised my children, and there was something that he said that really struck me. See, in the West, flowing to the East, by the time you are 12, 13, you almost think the world, your culture, gives you a license to be disrespectful to your parents. Why? A teenager already what? So God gave you a license in your teenage days to be disrespectful. Then you went through, then by about in your mid 20s or 30s, you can come back to being normal. You look high and low in the Bible, there is no such thing called teenager. It's a modern concept. In Jewish terms, a boy becomes a man at 12 years old. From that point onwards, he follows a teacher who teaches him the law. And the law teaches him to honour his parents, as the parents have taught him. We have bought into a fake idea called teenage adolescent years that gives us a fake licence to be dishonouring to parents. And what he said to me was totally staggering. I thought, Americans perhaps more liberal, I never allow my daughters to be disrespectful to us from the way they speak. I've been your pastor here for 30 years. I've tried to raise my kids that way. And even if I hear a disrespectful tone in my son or my daughter in their growing up years, I would say to them, try that again. That tone is not very respectful. Try it again. I've told you this encounter, right? I do not know what it was, and all of a sudden, I was speaking to my daughter. And then, I think, in a moment of pressure or crisis, the tone of voice wasn't good, my tone of voice to her. And then she said to me, you want to start again, Daddy? <laughs> you want to try that? Change your tone of voice? It might be better. You willing to change your tone of voice? Just tone of voice only. Right. It's quite different, no? Mona. Mona. <laughs> that first one is asking for a fight. Hey, darling. You can, hey, darling, in a sarcastic way. Hey, darling. <laughs> How come this one? It's all tones. It's all tones. It's all rebelliousness coming out. You can't hide that. He never gave them the chance, a license to be disrespectful. Maybe that's what we've got to take to heart. What about the difference Jesus makes to parents? The difference Jesus makes to fathers and to parents? What difference? Look hard at it. Fathers, 
Do not exasperate or frustrate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So here are a few things for us to take note. In the Roman world when this was given, there was a law. It's called patrias potestos. And patria potestos, a Latin phrase, is a law giving unlimited power to fathers over children to the point of capital punishment. Of course, this law could be abused. And I just went out, went to Google it again. You can Google it, Patria Protestas. And in a fallen world, the focus on power. And notice, in a Roman Empire with this kind of law, Paul, under God, is daring to ask fathers, don't you dare frustrate your children. Don't you dare exasperate your children. You may have legality to cover up depravity, but under God, you can't use legality to cover up depravity. You don't abuse the law of the land. You follow the law of Christ. You obey Jesus in your life. And so, why fathers? Why doesn't say fathers and mothers do not frustrate your children? Ever thought about that? Maybe, generally across the board, fathers and with this law backing them in the Roman world, were more prone to anger, more prone to the abuse of their rights. So men, fathers, please take note, if you are prone to anger and prone to inflict harm and hurt upon your children in a moment of meltdown, you have to be confessional and repentant about this. So what are some ways we may provoke or frustrate our children? We are to say no to what? We are say no to, right, don't exasperate them or frustrate them. Say no to subjective expectations. Say no to subjective comparisons. Say no to subjective punishment. So subjective expectation, I expect you to play the piano like Beethoven. You know how much your music lessons cost? I expect you to, to shoot baskets like Kobe Bryant. I expect you to run like Usain Bolt. Of course, nah, no, no you know, healthy-minded father would do that. But you never know, you see. There are expectations you have of your child that might crush his or her spirit. Then there's subjective comparisons. Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your cousin? Why can't you be... And I can give you anecdote after anecdote. I remember one. I went to preach in the Philippines. Before I got on, I, I was late for my plane. And this man begged to say, just, just 10 minutes. It's always 10 minutes. Right? Just 10 minutes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes went on for half an hour. And uh, he just went on. I hate Chinese New Year gatherings. I hate Christmas. I hate... Why, why do you hate? Every time I gather, my cousins come with newer cars, their business increased, but I still run my father's same old shop house. And my father keeps saying, why can't you be like your cousins? Why can't I hate every family gathering? That's a subjective comparison. Somewhere along the line, you live with that. Subjective punishment. Pray not to punish, to vent. Pray not to punish to get something off your chest. If you punish by venting, you vent and you punish. It's more about you than about the good of your children. So by God's grace, we say no to these things. What is it we say yes to? What is it we say no to, in summary? In the words of one commentator, you say no to anything that harms a child's sensibilities and a child's sensitivities. Sensibilities, you harm their rationality. Sensitivities, you harm their affections. Affections, their emotions. And we got to pray to be so, so mindful about that. We will all have failures in this. You said and did something that harmed the sensibilities or sensitivities of a child. I've told you this again and again of the story of Johnny Cash in the movie, right? You walk the line, Johnny Cash, country and western singer, and his elder brother, who his father loved very much, died in an accident on the farm. The father became a drunkard, one night came back drunkard, 
And as he came back, he walked through the door, at, at least in the scene in this movie, Johnny Cash stands there, he opens the door for the father, and the father looks at him and says, the wrong son died. And for the rest of his life, he went in a downhill spiral, Johnny Cash. He became the number one country and western singer. But he did drugs, he was in our marriages. You insult, you hurt and harm the sensibilities and the sensitivities of a child. It scars them for life. And when you know you have let loose a word, only bowing before the cross of Christ can reform that child that has been deformed by you and me. What is it we need to say yes to? Say yes to, right? you bring them up in the training and instruction. Training is a repeated word. Athletes use it. Soldiers use it. The fittest elder in ARPC is Elder Wingpo. He runs marathons. The rest of us cheers for him. We are good partners in Christ. You know what it's like to run a marathon? I have no idea. I can't even do five clicks. If I do five clicks, I'm very happy, but at least I can run. I thank God I can run. Some of you cannot run. <laughs> you want to keep yourselves fit? That's very, very important. Training and instruction. And so you say yes to what? Being a patient teacher. A patient teacher to your children. A gentle disciplinarian. So you know China just shut down the tuition industry. Why? And you're thinking, maybe Singapore should shut down our tuition industry too. Because it's worth millions of dollars. Because only the rich can afford tutors. And this goes on unbridled. You get those who can afford tutoring for everything. And then you got the poor who cannot afford tuition for anything. And they're going to lag behind. Ten years from now, you've got to really polarise. The Gini coefficient will be unbridgeable. At least that's one of the reasons given. And so, when are you most patient? as a teacher, when you're teaching other people's children, they'll say, Uncle Chris, uh, ayo, he will teach me again and again with my own children, how come you don't have my genes? Right? How come you got so much of mum in you? Right? How come? You don't say that, but you think that, sitting down there. Patient teacher, gentle disciplinarian, constant pointer to God. Bringing them up in the training instruction, obviously, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means, if I had to repeat this, I repeat the same Bible passage. You have heard different mutations of this. Repeat it again. Until in God's time you learn it. Oh, help me, God. I need help to be this parent. As much as given to fathers, mothers can also learn this. Oh, help me, God, to be a patient teacher, a gentle disciplinarian, a constant pointer to Jesus. A constant pointer, not to myself, but to the Lord of my life. And so I told you I watched quite a few 9-11 documentaries, which I highly commend that you watch. And it featured the commando unit of firemen in New York. The commando unit of the firemen in New York is called Emergency Services Unit, ESU. If you make the cut for that, you are a fireman above everyone else because they go in for the hardest cases. The two towers had collapsed, total meltdown, and it was just dust and dirt everywhere, mangled concrete and hole in the ground. So as they, they're walking, right, trying, they're trying to find as many survivors as possible. You've got to imagine it's totally pitch black. And as you walk, you... you sh you're trying to find, is there a hole here? Is there, you finally shine the torch. You can't see very much, but boy, it's 30 feet down. I fall down, I die. <laughs> so it was dead bodies, dead bodies, dead bodies everywhere. And then they, they heard a sound. They heard a sound. And who's going to go down that hole, the 30 feet hole? And this guy called Scott Strauss put up his hand. He went. It was a fellow fireman called Will Gimino. He got up as close to him as possible, but it was pitch dark, right? And he tried to move him. Both of them, he was pinned down, Will was pinned down underweight. So he's trying to move him, move him, 
cannot move him, cannot move him, can't do it, can't do it. Then Will turns to him and say, you're going to leave me? I understand. And Scott says to him, no, I'm not going to leave you. We're in this together. But as you listen to Scott give the interview afterwards, everything within him humanly, he was dead tired, he was dead scared, right? Everything within him wanted to leave. But what kept him there with Will? He thought to himself, if I give up now from sure exhaustion and sure fear, I go back to my family, what do I say to my son? What do I say to my children? How could I look my son in the eye and say to him, I left a man behind to die? He wanted his son to be able to look to him and say, my, my dad's a hero. He keeps pointing me to selfless love. We are pointers to Christ, no matter how feeble we are. And in some moments of life, we are just sure exhausted from living, let alone fathering and parenting. But we're going to try here in ARPC as in any church. So as we launch a new series, you will find discipleship written into every study at the end of the study. What does it mean to, be, to embark on marriage discipleship, family discipleship? And I say to you, by the grace of God, we can do this. So I end by asking you, is God and His Word background noise to you? Is Jesus background noise to you? Or is Jesus front and centre? If Jesus is front and centre, if you bring Jesus into anything, it changes everything. And you know that this marriage thing and this family thing and this church thing it's totally possible, yet not I, but Christ in me. Let's stand, pray, and sing this song in closing. Let's spend a few moments in humble recognition that all that God speaks to us in His Word is good for us good for our redemption, good for our salvation. May we capture afresh that we have a good God who had a good design, a benevolent God that invites us to beautiful shared moments. We also have an enemy who is out to stand against God and to destroy everything that God creates and to give us ugly moments in marriage and family and life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came in the fullness of time. The epitome of wisdom, fearing God, loving God. And to you we turn, and to know that as we bring you into anything in life, it will change everything. And so we turn to you as fail and feeble children, as parents, and ask for new beginnings as we call you our Saviour and our Lord. And as we do this, day by day, until your return, may we say increasingly with great joy, yet not I, but through Christ in us. Amen.
Spirit of God, empower us that we might say, with every breath I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but Christ in me. We pray this for our single lives, we pray this for our marriages, we pray this for our children, we pray this for our families, we pray that will be a shining light because Jesus, you have done it. To you we turn, in you we trust, in you we hope, for all things to bring glory to our Father. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. We're now going to disperse you in an orderly manner. Right? Actually, there are so few, we can all go at once. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, Sorry, I totally...